from the heart of Dubai, where tomorrow is being built today to the world. Welcome to the CTO Show with Mehmet. Here, we redefine technology and reimagine possibilities. With Mehmet, delve into the riveting realms of AI, cybersecurity, and digital technology. Experience the thrilling highs and lows of startups. Immerse yourself in the spirit of entrepreneurship and witness the future of business innovation being written in real time. Now, without further ado, let's tune in and explore the future. Hello and welcome back to a new episode of the CTO Show with Mehmet. Today, I'm very pleased joining me, Praveen. Praveen, thank you very much for, you know, joining me on the show. The reason I don't introduce people, you know, and the people keep asking me because I have a belief that no one can introduce someone else other than themselves. So the floor is yours, Praveen. Tell us a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Sure. Well, first of all, Mehmet, thank you so much for, for having me. And I'm really excited to chat today uh, with you. Um, my name is Praveen Kalamegam. I'm the CTO here at, uh, at WorkRise. Um, we are uh, a, a technology company focused on building uh, the supply chain platform for energy. Um, I have been uh, in technology for my entire career, so the past uh, uh, couple decades and a half uh, of, of time. It, it feels less when you, when you say it that way instead of like 20, 30 years. Um, and I started my career at, uh, I, I like to describe it as I've, I've kind of come up the stack. So I started my career in kind of embedded systems and, uh, and on operating systems. I worked on the, the Unix kernel as part of Solar, uh, Solaris for Sun and AIX for IBM and Linux for a time and, and kind of slowly moved up my stack to, uh, up the stack to um, uh, like software as a service. Uh, eventually, and 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 that's really where uh, now I find myself in the past uh, several jobs that I've been in. Um, uh, like I started very much hands on as a as a as an engineer, as a software engineer, uh, and that's that's I think still where my passion lies is tinkering uh, with software. And it's such a wonderful time to uh, to be in that uh, space because of how rapidly it's moving and evolving. Um, but I did find uh, a passion for leading organizations of brilliant software engineers and product uh, folks and designers uh, and researchers. And, um, and that, that's what brought me into um, more of the leadership track, uh, you know, as VPs of engineering and CTOs and things of that nature. And here I have you know, been at WorkRise for the past four years, and it's been a wonderful ride here. Um, every single one of these uh, jobs uh, or roles that you take, I, I feel is like kind of a chapter in a long story, which, which becomes your career. And I think probably halfway through, uh, I became far more intentional about uh, what role I picked and what what place I chose to spend my time at. Uh, and with WorkRise, it was specifically about like I, I wanted to. I had come from companies that had done um, really amazing and and quite uh, you know global scale, challenging technical things, um, but uh, maybe not as tangible about like how is this you know how is this impacting. The world at large and all of us. And uh, with with WorkRise, I was I was keen to join a mission that was attempting to do something rather uh, uh, rather uh, you know large like that. Um, and 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 it, and certainly has has fit the bill uh, since then. That's cool. And thank you again, Praveen, for being with uh, with me today on on this episode. Now, usually, out of curiosity, I ask this question sometime, like. As you been, you describe it like you you've been like on, on the full stack, mm -hmm. but I think there should be something that motivated you later to focus, you know, on 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 this innovative approach because you know like for me coming from also like a technical background, so always you know I, I was exposed to many things, but at some stage in my career I went and focused, for example, on infrastructure, right? So rather mm -hmm. and, and and little bit security. And then, you know, I left the networking, I left the software development because, you know, I found myself, you know, like there's something that attached me to that. And, you know, yep. like this is kind of out of curiosity. I love to ask my guests, like what attracted you to the software development, you know, and, and you know, like on focusing on innovation, actually, and the embedded systems and SaaS platform. Like, was there something special that attracted you to take this, uh, this path rather than, yep. for example, being on... And you mentioned you work on the kernels of the Linux systems right. and Unix right. systems, right? So just yep. out of curiosity, you know, what, what drove you to take this path? 
Yeah, that's that's I mean, it's an interesting question. It's probably one I don't think nearly enough about. Um, I so I have to I have to give it to my dad uh, and my father who um, from a very young age always had computers present. We weren't like of uh, significant means growing up. We're an immigrant family, but somehow he scrounged together uh you know the dollars to to get like a commodore 64 and then an, you know an apple II. i recently learned not an actual apple II because that would have been too expensive so it was a clone of an apple II, but still uh, <laughs> was able to learn from that and uh and computers all throughout my life and so uh from a young age kind of dabbling in like very basic uh software development i wouldn't even call it that at that point um but it, it it kind of planted that seed, and then uh, so I I I give a tremendous amount of credit for uh, to to him for kind of surrounding me in that environment. So it was very natural for me to like just kind of have that bug all the way through school. I did computer and electrical engineering uh, at um, at the University of Texas here in Austin. Uh, I did a couple degrees here, at mat- bachelor's and masters uh, in that uh, uh, in in that program and that that's a really interesting it wasn't the computer science which is a different department there it was the it was the you know ECE department which was uh you know in the engineering uh, uh college and uh it had it's sort of a, a different approach some overlap certainly but a different approach to problem solving a lot of respect for the computer science program as well but this was more for me it was it was a, it was far more applied and it gave me a, a much more uh broad sense of like um, almost like, um, you know, from, from like, how, how does any of this work? How are we talking on video? And you can go like layer by layer, by layer, by layer, all the way down to like the transistor. And that was, that was foundational for me. It gave me a great palette to choose from when I was entering my career. So when I went into the, the, like the first job, it was actually also in energy. It was a startup doing, um, these remote telemetric devices that you could position strategically around power lines around the nation. And they would measure the magnetic field coming emanating from those power lines and be able to predict uh power power flow and power as a commodity uh you can trade on that and so when you have some you know uh large understanding of that it can give you an adv- potentially an advantage uh on uh, on trying to uh invest and plan for uh for energy needs so i uh, i got to kind of scratch both both itches there uh i was you know very much on the bare metal I really had to understand the circuitry and uh, of, of that um, of that device, um, but it was certainly a software role, and I was I was uh, working uh, you know much more in, uh, on the on the software side and responsible for that side. Uh, the I, I think what what ended up like drawing me more towards the software side is for for me anyways it um, it it's I, I spent a good deal of my career probably half my career always very closely tied to hardware. So even when you're working in a in a, in a uh, uh, like on Solaris or AIX for 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 Unix, uh, and after that I was working on uh, Linux as part of like some IO virtualization company. All of that is pretty well tied to the to the hardware that you are trying to support, and uh, there's a speed with which you can go uh, in in that uh, in that space. And I think that when you when you evolve to pure software, man, it goes way faster. And it, uh, and I think I was attracted to that. So it drew, drew me towards more pure software plays. Interestingly enough, I find myself now uh, 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 evolving further. So I was in pure software for some time and now evolving back to not uh, the marriage between software and hardware, but the marriage between software and people in the real world, doing real world problems. That's ultimately what we try and tackle here at WorkRise. Uh, a lot of companies are really in this space. That's kind of like the, the phase of, of technology enablement. I think we are with software. Um, and so there is a slowdown from that, but it's a, it, it's a valuable one, right? Because it's about uh, ultimately meeting people where they are and enabling, in, uh, enabling their lives and what they're trying to do. And so uh, I think that's kind of what's, uh, what's guided me to, uh, through the, uh, the, the different roles and, and, and companies that I've worked for. Uh, hopefully that that kind of touches on what you're asking about. Oh, indeed, definitely, definitely it did. And you, to your point, and I loved you know the last part when you said about you know not manage of hardware and software, but again like solving real business problems. And this is why you know personally I get passionate about technology. Of course, at a younger age, yeah, because I was fascinated of you know seeing all these cool things. But then you know later on you start to understand oh like 
with software or even hardware, I can actually solve real world problems. Right. And here, this will bring me, you know, to talk a little bit about your current role and, you know, about Warcry specifically. And sure. I mean, and, you know, the, the, the thing that also excited me, honestly, because this is one of the few areas that I think I didn't have a, a lot of guests to talk about it, right? So, mm. like, it's something related to uh, supply chain, something related to energy. So if you can a little bit tell me, uh, Praveen, about, you know, WorkRise mission and how your platform is, you know, helping, you know, the energy sector's label provision and, you know, do the operations management services. So like a little bit more details, if you want, about uh, the company. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, I, I talked about how we're trying to build the platform uh, for energy for supply chain. Um, we attempt to make it easier for energy companies and energy service companies uh, and energy workers, uh, which are kind of like the three nodes of the triangle involved here. Uh, we try and make it easier for them to work together uh, to deliver the projects that power our world, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a deceptively simple mission that involves a great deal of uh, uh, challenging problems to overcome. And so when we look at that problem space of like, how do we, how do we help energy companies as you know, service providers, energy service providers and energy workers? How do we help them uh, be more productive? How do we help them be safer? How do we help them uh, save money, right? How do they be more efficient, in, in other words? Um, how, do, how do we do that? And when we look at the problems and challenges they face in that space um, and, and what I call like kind of asked, uh, kind of figure out what the five why problem is, right? The one why problem might be some acute problem somewhere along the, the, the list litany of things that you do in a day or a week. Um, but the five why problem is, is, it gets into like, why is all of this so hard for all of us? Like we're, we're probably causing many of the problems ourselves in hopes of solving some other problem that we've, we've, we've found to be, um, you know, causing friction for us. So when we dig down and when we ask that, five why problem. I think we come to, this is a very low trust ecosystem. Now I don't mean the participants in this ecosystem are, uh, are untrustworthy, far from. Um, it's that because of the dynamics with which these, uh, these participants, energy companies, suppliers, workers uh, have to interact because of how the, the dynamics with, within which they have to interact. And because of the high stakes of uh, safety and quality uh, in in regards to this uh, and 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 cost right these are massively expensive projects um, there's just a, you know that, that there's a high bar there and that high bar has resulted in friction points um, a lot of people uh, like so for example let me kind of just paint a like a more concrete picture from the energy company's standpoint so like any it could be a small operator um, you know, uh, a, a small operator who just kind of works in one basin or one region. It could be, you know, one of the super majors, um, you know, at Chevron, Exxon, et cetera. Um, it, 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 like they face very similar challenges, which is like, we have energy projects to do. We know that we can't do those entirely alone. We, we lean and depend upon uh, a network of vendors, uh, like suppliers that, uh, produ provide like hundreds of different services that we need for this particular project. Um, we need to make sure that we like have a, a, like a pool that's deep enough that we're, we're, we're not like stuck because we're waiting on someone. We have to make sure that every single one of those hundreds of vendors is vetted to the, you know, the, the work requirements that we have that could be aspects of like safety, like, uh, you know, safety uh, scores and, and thing, uh, like incident rates and things of that nature. It, it's about insurance, like how much insurance you have, like various characteristics that we need to, or work requirements that we need to, the, the, they would need to vet on hundreds of vendors, right? To, and, and it's not just enough to do that once, you kind of have to have a, a, a real-time sense of who is still above that line. Then you have to figure out like what rates should be charged for this. And finally, like you pass that like sheet of, and oftentimes it is a sheet of the vendors to your various field field ops managers so that they can use it, the supervisors in the field, so they can use this list, right? Okay, this is the list of folks that I can work with. 
And then they start using and they're like, these people aren't available or they're not answering or now I need to like reach out to my network. And 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 then you start to see the, the challenge, right? It's like the supply chain kind of represents the centralized uh, in se- uh, the incentralized motivations from that uh, that company, whether small or large, and at, at a Chevron, it could be like you know a huge department of that company. At a small mom and pop operator, it could be one person. It could be a part of one person's time, right? But regardless, their concerns are: I need to make sure I'm working with people for the right rates who are compliant with uh, safety standards uh, and are readily available for the projects I need in the regions I need it for the services I need, right? So that's that's the problem space that they have. So, um, you know, when, when, when the large operators uh, and the super majors, they face that problem, what they do is they say, okay, we're going to, we're going to defend ourselves against this by uh, creating our own like kind of micro ecosystem of vendors. And then it becomes this big thing. Like vendors are like, okay, uh, like I, I, I really need to, get to the bar where I can work with Chevron. I want that, um, what's called an MSA with them so I can work with them. And that's, that's a, that's a big boon for them, but it's also a big pain for them, right? Because every time I work for a new big company, I got to do everything their way. So I got to do, uh, I got to do like the, uh, the tracking their way. I got to do the vettings their way. I got to submit invoices their way. And then that's fine. Okay. You know, for all the business I get for Chevron, I, I'm willing to do that. But now I work for a net new company as well. I'm trying to build my business and I add yet another super major and they have completely different ways to do it. Now I have to grow my back office to help handle all of that variations and complexity across the way. And so that's just kind of like a sliver of what the, like the pain that, that develops over time. Uh, the salute, like, when people are trying, when operators in good faith are trying to solve these problems, they actually end up exacerbating the problems. They'll buy systems that help rationalize their space, but make it harder for the ecosystem at large because it's just yet another, uh, you know, variation that needs to be handled by all the vendors that um, that work with them. So that's that's the problem space that we have. And and the one thing I'll layer on here, which is really important, is that it doesn't work, right? Everything that they're doing doesn't work. Uh, the dispute rate, meaning like how often an invoice is submitted from one of these suppliers to a vendor, how often is that disputed? And it's between like 20 and 50 percent, depending on the, 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 the part of the, um, of the type of service provided. Right. But between 20 and 50 percent of those disputes are uh, or invoices are disputed. Now, disputed might be like you're missing you're missing a cost code. Uh, or something small, a well name here, or whatever else that helps us like file things off in, in our back office. Uh, but it could be large. It could be like you charge the wrong rate or this is not the right price. I'm not going to pay for this. Right. You are compliant. Uh, there's various other things that could could be in that bucket as well. But when you're talking about a 20 to 50 percent dispute rate, no wonder there's all this friction here. Right. Uh, and and I just I, I think about uh I think about this in a different um, example. It's a little bit more tangible for me as a human. Uh, is like my credit card, right? So like we all have a credit card, uh, and if our credit card disputes were like one in five, right, which is like twenty percent. If one in five of the times I swipe that card, uh, there's a dispute that I have to deal with. I'm never using that card, right? That would be crazy. Uh, and and to be honest. Keep going, order a baggage dude. If it was one in 50, I would never use that card. If it was one in 500, I would never use that card. If it was one in 5,000, maybe I'd use it, but I'd check weekly to make sure there's no, you know, no weird things happening. But at some point at one in 50,000 and one in, you know, 5 million, right? At some point I let go and say, oh yeah, like this is, this is, of course I'm going to use this. There's like very, very low risk um, that this is going to be problematic for me. And so I take it for granted. Not only that, but like, as we all know, like the banks won't even... Uh, ding us for when there is a dispute, when there is a problem. They'll because it's such a low risk that they can basically quantify that, insure against it, and 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 take that risk entirely off of us. So that's kind of like what we are attempting to do, right? It's not just tackling that dispute rate, but that's one of the main symptoms that we we follow and 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 look at in this industry. And when we can ensure that. Um, like we're kind of making more consistent tools for everyone to benefit from. We're building it out here in the ecosystem, not in the back office of one operator. 
And when we can kind of ensure that the structural uh, components of these jobs is reported well in advance, it streamlines the way in which all of these folks work together. It just, it, it, again, no one is, um, like, or, or very, very rarely is someone trying to intentionally put a mistake in. Very rarely is someone trying to charge the wrong rate or miss the cost code or don't have the signature. Like these are very rare circumstances where someone's actually trying to do that. Most likely it's that they didn't know they had to do that or they fat fingered the wrong thing. And in a, you know, in a disparate systems across the way and paper here and, you know, Rolodex there, uh, Excel sheet in some places, like that's, that's rife with with problems, rife with errors along the way. So that's that's the problem space we're trying to tackle. That's kind of the philosophy of how we try and tackle it. Um, and we're making great progress against that. And people are excited about it. You know, they they want to see it, right? And 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 I respect them for that. But this is this is where we're we're playing. You know, uh, Praveen, I can relate to many things you mentioned because uh, when I was working as a consultant, of course, I covered a lot of. Uh, verticals and of course like energy is one of them and just you know the amount of you know just the people who are in the building and i'm talking here like i'm based in dubai and you know the middle east also has one of the large large oil producers and so on so just you know when you see all these four going in going out and you know different departments so i i started to relate a few things and even you know when we're talking to, to the it department let's say and even there, like you can see the complexities behind and, you know, because there are contractors, subcontractors, you know, like a lot of things that goes there. And when they have a new project all together, it's like you are having a new entity within the big entity itself. So okay. all what you said, maybe maybe I got it, so, but just for, for the audience, you know, like really it's a big problem. And because yeah. I didn't live it myself, but I've seen, you know, these uh, giants, I would say, they have it. And of course, to your point, the sub the contractors, and then you have the subcontractors sometimes that they need right. to uh, to do this. So absolutely, you know, I, I, I it's a huge and uh, tremendous, I would say, you know, uh, things that happens in the background that us, you know, as as people who just consume, let's say, right. um, th that product, we don't see it maybe. But now, you know, Praveen, I think. And you, maybe you would agree with me or not, we will see now. Like this is a very also dynamic uh, space, the, the energy sector, right? So it's, a, it's fast moving and innovation is key. So how do you think you you, you are able to drive this innovation, um, you know, while having this complexity at the same time? Mm -hmm. And like, what are the technological advancements that, you know, you, you try, you know, to implement, to streamline these traditionally complex processes? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, uh, <laughs> one of the things that I think is amazing to me is that, uh, we, like our clients are some of the most innovative companies on the planet. Uh, they, they are like operating in some, uh, you know, large room in Houston and controlling uh, like machinery that's halfway across the world, uh, live. And that, that is like astounding, the kind of, uh, innovation that's required to do that, um, safely. Uh, and, and so it's remarkable that those are the same clients that, um, really struggle with the innovation of their actual workflow and their supply chain and, and really how all of those things work. And to be honest, I, I don't put that necessarily on them. This is not something that I think one entity can solve for themselves um, in isolation. Uh, and that's, that's, you know, ultimately our, our philosophy is that this has to be, you know, a systemic so solution and it has to be done for the ecosystem at large. And that, that actually takes a lot of participation and partnership with, um, with both sides, uh, like all sides of that, uh, of that ecosystem. Um, you know, so like when, when we think about like, how do we innovate our way through some, some of these problems, Many of the things that we're trying to do are not new, right? They might be new for the energy space, a, a particularly challengingly, a challenging and entrenched area where disruption has not necessarily occurred. Um, like there's been many attempts to try and kind of create uh, like some variation of Uber for the oil field, right? And like we, we've even had our own attempts at, at that. And, and part, of, part of that uh, vision of like 
kind of like whatever I need, whenever I need it, call it on my phone and it shows up. Ultimately, that I think will happen if we're succeeding, right, in, in what we're trying to do. Um, but you can't jump straight to that because, again, all of the things I talked about, the stakes are too high for this to be as simple as the, the first order, um, you know, the first order ride share or apartment share uh, types uh, tech, technology companies. Astounding as they are, are, really amazing what they've been able to accomplish. But the barriers to entry here are much higher. Um, and so the way in which we think about innovating is certainly inspiration from industries that have been able to successfully do this. Uh, but also, re really, like we, we've been in this space for 10 years now, and we are uh, we have a, a, a lot of really uh, uh, brilliant um, uh, folks from oil and gas, like their careers have been spent there. And now they're spending it uh, with us here at WorkRise to try and solve these, some of these some of these pain points that they've felt viscerally and directly. Um, and so listening to our clients is a big part of this. Uh, the domain ex expertise to understand the nuances, being able to map that to solutions that have worked in other spaces and bring those to bear here. And so we don't have to reinvent the wheel in all cases. Now that I'll you know, I'll put that there, but then I'll also talk about kind of the elephant in the room, which is how how rapidly technology is moving, specifically in the space of, of AI. Uh, and I, I guess you should have a timer on all your podcasts about how long it takes to talk about AI. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're like 25 minutes in. Uh, so how does how does that play into it? And, you know, for us in, in specifically, I, I again look at like, look, AI is not new. And there are a tremendous number of like um, like well-trodden paths around how we can leverage both AI and ML type uh, solutions to solve problems in our space. Uh, a, a lot of this, a lot of the uh, challenges in this space are about everything being completely unstructured. So the challenge of unstructured to structure is a, a wonderful problem space for AI, and so we look for for that in 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 many in many places that we're uh, in our platform. Uh, we are trying to apply that type of uh, technology to that problem. Um, but I think that in, in a lot of other ways, especially in the more like nascent advancements in, in large language models, um, those, those provide potentially the ability for a leapfrog of, uh, uh, for solutioning, right? And so what we try and do there is have at least some capacity stored, uh, stored away for or, or applied towards um, moonshots, right? Where it's like, okay, let's look at these traditional problems that we face. But let's look at non-traditional ways in which we might leapfrog what we would have otherwise done. And it's okay if we fail. We have a contained amount of investment in this. We'll learn a lot even if we fail. But let's, uh, let's ensure that we are trying to stay on kind of the crest of the wave uh, as it moves so quickly here uh, and, and in trying to apply those to our problems. Because, you know, one in a hundred times, that's actually going to come through. That's going to be this leapfrog solution where it's like you wouldn't have iterated your way to that. Right. Um, you, you, you really needed like there's there's evolution, there's revolution. And, and sometimes we really need to make sure that we are looking for those, you know, the uh, the, 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 the secular opportunities there. Again, I can relate to many things you mentioned, Praveen, and, uh, you know, especially about the adoption. And I think this vertical is special. I mean, they are open to adopt new technologies, but I think. Um, you know, again, from my humble experience, I'm not saying yeah. like I'm the ex I'm the most experienced guy here. You know, the kind of you know the way they do things. You know, like I mean, you, you mentioned some of it, like the way that they have like specific standards, or for example, there are very strict procedures you need to follow. So any any change that needs to happen, sometimes it needs to go, you know, for four, five, six, maybe sometimes ten approvals just to maybe yeah. do a small shift. So yeah, I, I think, you know, like, but but again, uh, I think they started to feel the heat, I would say that, you know, we need also to change this and we, we need to, to move fast. And I think it's going to happen from my humble experience again, because if also a very regulated vertical, which is like, mm -hmm. and you gave an example from banks, actually, like, like if banks can, you know, people they didn't expect that they will, they will move that fast, especially when they saw like fintech, what's the way and they would be left behind. So I think you know maybe something similar could could happen with with, the, with, with this vertical, yeah. but I know you know like you mentioned a little bit previously, 
this concept of having, you know, like you, you call it digital system of record, right? It's mm-hmm. like a capturing each step for every project. And I think yep. this is something, you know, it's it's revolutionary by itself. So how do you think this system can, you know, foster the trust and transparency, especially because of all the things you mentioned also, like they, they have a lot of things that sometimes not like trusting on a person level, but I, again, I, I mean, as a company, when you come to me as a contractor, I need to make sure that, hey, like if I give you this project to build a new, uh, I don't know, panel or I, I will give you to build a new rig or, you know, whatever the project is, I need to make sure that you are doing to me in the in, in trustful way. But how do you think, you know, what you mentioned can help also to, uh, you know, impact or it can help them imp- to do an impact on the operational efficiency overall? Because at the end, and this is back to the thing you mentioned, we're trying to use technology to solve a real business problem. Yeah, yeah, we call it like the unbroken digital chain, right? Meaning the um, like the connected, uh, connecting all the way from uh, you know procurement to payment. Which, like, if if you want to start a company in supply chain in in any industry, at some point on your website, you're going to say we solve procure to pay. So like, I'm I'm not trying to. Uh, Uh, say we're somewhat unique in that regard, but that's ultimately the challenge, right? It's like, I need to, how do you help me find who I need and build a, like a connective relationship all the way through to uh, where I've utilized their services and, and I'm now transacting to pay for those services. How do you ensure that your platform takes me from A to Z there? And then I can see this connection all the way through. And to us, that's the unbroken digital chain. And so like when, uh, when I think, let me, let me do it in two steps. One is like status quo today, what can go wrong? And so sometimes it'll be that, um, you know, the relationship between an op, uh, like a, like a, an energy company and a supply, a service provider, uh, that's made by the supply chain team. They get their, you know, their contract signed, their MSAs. Um, they even establish, uh, you know, some sort of some sort of work order saying, OK, well, these are the types of things that you can do for us. And these are the rates I'm expecting you to charge. And we put you through onboarding. So we've made sure that you're, you're you know, you're compliant and, and from a safety and, and financial standpoint, uh, they've done all that. That's kind of the supply chain side. Now, this is uh, this con- this uh, ser- service provider is considered part of their their approved vendor list. And so the field can start using that, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll forego the the challenge in, in the field knowing who they can call. Let's assume they do have that, and they call they call this vendor up, and they have them come do work. The vendor sends some folks to do the work on site. Um, you know, it could be as simple as cutting the grass. It could be you know far more uh, complicated or high risk downhole uh, work. It could be water hauling. It could be any number of things uh, that they have to have done on the on the on the project. And uh, then, you know, they write some things down on a piece of paper, which is their field ticket. They go back, they put it in some, uh, some bowl in the, in, in the home office for that, uh, for that service provider. Uh, maybe a week later, uh, someone in that back office for that service provider collects all the tickets, puts them into an invoice, sends it to that original uh, company. And at that point, they say, wait a minute. Oh, by the way, like this is uh, the, all of these companies because, because they're like, they're the buyers. They, they've they've uh, been able to kind of make the standard like these net 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 sixty terms right net, uh, meaning like sixty days to pay these these things sometimes lo- longer than that even uh, so like it might be that this this invoice gets sent now we're already like a week and a half after the work was done and then there might be a delay in them actually looking at it because it's a net sixty then they finally say oh you know what you're missing this uh, this AFE this uh, you know uh, auth- the, uh, the uh, authorized uh, for expenditure code, basically a cost code in, in, in energy. Uh, so, you you know, dispute gets sent back. And then the vendor goes and says, oh, crap, let me look up that field ticket. Maybe that can you call them and figure it out? And so then they go back and they say, OK, we found it. Here you go. Uh, and finally, it, it gets paid. Um, this is not helping anyone, right? Like you, you could naively say, oh, look at that. Like the, the, the energy company got kind of like, let's say, 90 days where they didn't have to pay for the services rendered, right? It was like a 90 day zero interest loan, but that doesn't help because the vet, the supplier is basically charging more to overcome the fact that it takes them a long time to get paid, right? Because disputes are high. 
than because there are these net 60s and whatever else, right? So that's the status quo of this whole thing. And the, the mistake made was an honest one, which is like, oh, shoot, I forgot to enter that number. I didn't have that number or it wasn't on the field ticket, so I didn't put it in. This is the same thing we did last week. Why, isn't, why didn't you just look at that? So, that, you know, honest, uh, honest folks work in trying to make this, uh, make this happen and, and mistakes can be made and it can result in large delays and large inefficiency. So when we talk about the unbroken digital chain, we, let's rewind that whole thing all the way back to that procurement stage where they locked in these contracts. Well, those contracts are digital objects in our platform. And they stipulate structurally what they represent, saying you're allowed to do these certain things. By the way, these certain things, you can only do them in these locations. And by the way, you need to be able to charge these rates for the activities within those, right? So now that's all locked in. Whether you use it or not, that's, that's kind of locked in in a structured way. Now, when the, uh, the field needs to use their AVL, they have a real-time list of all of the vendors who have, um, you know, have these contracts in place. Not only that, but we ensure that they are compliant and they are currently compliant. Not one, you know, three, three months ago I checked and they were compliant. Like today, are they compliant, right? So like, that's what we provide that field is like, I don't have to call supply chain. I don't have to deal with the, the internal dynamics and complexity and friction there. I just log in and say like, I need someone to do this in this location. You're telling me these three are my options. I'm good to go with any of them. I'll call the first one. So, so that, that part simplified. Not only that, but when that person is doing the work, that, that, that service provider is doing the work, they're not working off paper. They're working through the app. The app is connected to the request that was made from the field. That, that request that was made was connected to the original work order. And so they, now you're starting to see the connected dots, right? These unbroken digital chain prevents problems from occurring. So now the field, uh, the field ticket, the digital field ticket that's being submitted, it can't you can't submit the wrong rate because you know the rate. The rate is already connected and provided for you, right? So by virtue of these things being connected and co like collected at the right time up front and provided at the right time of use, you prevent errors. And you prevent them from skipping the step of entering that AFE that was required. And so now it gets submitted and uh, we have, and it's, it, it's, it's approved digitally as well from the person from the field who requested it. So now we have this entire chain. So think about a dispute now. The, the, the energy company is the one that set up this relationship. The energy company is the one that agreed to these structured rates. The energy company's field is the one who called in this work. The energy company's field is the one who approved this work. At that point, what are you disputing, right? So that's, that's what trust looks like. Trust does not look like opacity and just saying, trust me, right? Trust looks like complete transparency. Trust looks like it's, it's transparent. It's there just like my credit card. If I log in right now, I can see every single transaction. But I tell you, I never do that, right? Because it's, that's what trust looks like. It's transparency. And so what we're trying to do with the Unbroken Digital Chain is provide that transparency so everyone has that trust. And when everyone has that trust, I believe and this, you know, you can, you can put this in the, uh, uh, the two cents bucket because probably, you know, who knows if it's true, but I believe the dispute rates will fall. And I believe if dispute rates fall, those, those net sixties that I was talking about, I think those start to go away. I think this starts to look more like a clearinghouse where money flows independent, like based on that approval, immediate, instant between these two entities because there's nothing else to question, right? That's the gold standard of this. That's what we should be striving for. And there's ways in which we can iterate towards it. Right now, the key is to show the transparent chain. And that's where we're focused. Again, I can relate to many points. And, you know, like it's, uh, it's like, you know, being proactive and then having like you call it a centralized source of trust, right? So uh, if I'm doing a contact, I'm trying to simplify it, you know, a little bit. Um, so I do a contact with you, Praveen. I, I'm your provider. You're like the company who's giving me the contact. Right. So we know, we know, you know, how much I'm going to charge you per task, right? And I have a catalog of tasks. And then you say, okay, I need to go today, do this task in this location. I go there, I clear it out. And then, you know, because it's everything documented and it's in, within, within, I mean, the workflow, let's call it, that you have. So I, I, you cannot come and say, hey, Mehmet, like, you didn't do this because 
we didn't agree that, you know, this is the scope of work, but the scope of work was pre-approved first. You know, and, you know, I, I think majority of the time, and this is not only in the energy sector, I think this happens a lot, even in our technology sector as well. So, because, you know, I, I deal a lot with VARs and, you know, service providers. And I think, you know, maybe even they need something like this because, you know, when they get awarded the project, majority of the time, if you, I, and I hear the stories from both sides because I was working with the, with the vendor. So I, I'm, I'm the supplier, yes, but I mean, I don't do the implementation. And then, hey, like, yeah, the customer didn't put this in the scope of work or the customer would say, hey, but I was expecting you by default to do this. So you see like these frictions. Yeah. And again, to the payment, and you know, I, I come from a pain, again, not related to energy maybe, but I believe on energy on a larger scale because also the, the amount of money we're talking about, the amount of the, you know, the size yeah. of the contract is larger. But even I can relate on a smaller scale, I can imagine how big the problem is actually. Right. And you know, the solution you're putting in place is, 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 is fantastic. Now, out of curiosity, because when I was on the website, I've seen something related to sustainability and COP, which was here, by the way, in Dubai. So how do you think, you know, if, I, if I'm going to go and look to the bigger picture, so how do you think, you know, what you're doing at Workrise from this innovation perspective would help these global energy companies to do the transition? And what do you think in general the technology role would be in shaping in, in, in a more sustainable and efficient future especially for the energy sector, knowing that all the companies in that sector, whether in the US and in Europe and here in the Middle East, you know, they have on their agenda, you know, how we can become more efficient, uh, sustainable, yeah. and, you know, like uh, remove a little bit all the attention from us as a carbon footprint companies to something else. So what's your, what's your vision on this? Uh, for me? Yeah, uh, I think our, 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 our philosophy, and this is certainly something I personally believe is that like, we 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 should avoid like thinking about energy in some sort of like there's good energy and there's bad energy uh, sort of way. I think we we it, we we can look at the problem far more objective uh, objectively than that. And uh, in in that objective view of the problem, like you can go around the world and look at the distribution of where energy is coming from. There's no such thing as a world without oil and gas today. And if we want that to be something that's true. In uh, in 50 years or 100 years, then like we, we should be having a far more objective conversation of what that diversification looks like, and it's going to be steps and evolve, and and I guarantee we don't know what all those steps need to be. We can make a statement about what we think they are today, and let's take those first steps together. So with that view in mind, uh, it is our firm conviction is where the change and diversification is needs to come from and will most likely come from is from energy companies today right these are the 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 entities in the position to actually make the largest impact in in an objective sense of what we are trying to do and many of them actually do now maybe they don't do it in the ways that um uh, that everyone uh wants right and so there's there's certainly views that say like I won't accept any um, you know, any uh, energy transition that continues to produce, um, you, know, uh, you know, like emit carbon into the atmosphere. Um, but like, again, if we take this back to like the objective, tra the objective goals that we seek, uh, th there's, o there's only a few that will actually happen. So let's take those steps and let let's not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. So if we then take the view of like, okay, well, these, these energy companies need to be the ones that help with a good, like a huge chunk of this transition, how do we help them diversify? They are way too entrenched and slow because of the problems that we talked about for the first uh, half of this uh, time together, right? To do that, right? There's so much friction for them to find and vet and, uh, and work with the vendors in their own domain. How are you expecting them to do that effectively and at the speed we need in new domains, in nascent domains? They will not be able to, right? And so uh, what we are trying to, uh, to provide, and ultimately this is kind of like the core of what this is all for, right? We have a mission about uh, helping, uh, helping them uh, move easier, faster, and safer to power our world, but it's in pursuit of like the need that we all have in their diversification to continue to power our world in a way that's sustainable for us. So, um, you know, we, 
we don't think that we're not a company that is going to solve sustainability in a direct sense, but we do feel we have a tremendous impact that can be made in an indirect sense by making these companies far more efficient, by giving them far more transparency of the field at play uh, in all of these nascent technologies. We, we have had um, experience in our 10 years in, uh, in many of the renewable space, mostly on the labor side for solar uh, and wind. Uh, and, and we've learned from, from much of that uh, and many of our clients right now in oil and gas, they are they are tremendously interested in spending some of the most uh, money uh, on uh, diversification and renewable projects. Uh, oftentimes, the challenge and the friction is I don't know, like I don't necessarily know who the players are in the space that I would need to get that done. Right. One of our, uh, you know, one of the uh, companies that we're helping right now is a company called Fervo which I believe is staffed with a lot of like ex oil and gas folks, um, but they're working on like geothermal type solutions, which such an incredible overlap between the advanced uh, understanding and technology from oil and gas uh, directly re uh, related to how they're able to do some of these geothermal solutions. And I think they're even playing with some like long-term battery storage, um, leveraging spent wells and just some like absolutely fascinating things that they're trying. That's what diversification and evolution looks like. It's not a completely different set of people uh, who, uh, from our current energy space. It's an evolution of our energy space. And so we need to be part of that evolution. Fantastic. Now, Praveen, I want to ask you a question, maybe not related to, to, sure. to, to yeah. work specifically, but from the discussion that I, I had with you, and I need, you know, this, uh, you know, kind of, your secret sauce for fellow people who want to become CTOs. You know what I yeah. noticed, Praveen, really, uh, you know, that the way that you have not only understood the business case and, you know, related to technology, but actually you dive very deep into understanding, you know, also how, I mean, how the whole thing works there. Mm -hmm. So, and you know, I, I see it, I, I talk to a lot of people and you know what they tell me, you know what, like I'm a techie guy, you know, the, don't don't talk to me about business. I, I want to, but at the same time, if you ask him or you ask her, like, what's your ambition? Uh, yeah, I want one day to become a CTO, right? And, yeah. Or I want to be an executive. What's the secret sauce, Praveen, to, to yeah. really grasp these two together and, you know, have both strong understanding, of course, of technology, which we know, like, I would not ask you how to become a good programmer or how to become a good solution architect, you know, plenty of resources out there. But, you know, having this merger between the business side and, and the technology side, which I think this is the main thing why, you know, the CTO position is very important. So, so how we can reach that, Praveen? Like yeah. I'm, I'm asking this question on behalf of many people who have the ambition to become CTOs. Sure. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm so glad that, like, there are shows like yours, right, who interview, uh, like, le technology leaders. Uh, and probably, I, ho I hope you ask each one of them something like this, um, because it's probably not so much a secret uh, as it is, like, patterns of success and also failure modes to, to avoid. I think you touched upon a big one, which is um, when you're part of, when, when you're joining, I, I think a lot of folks just think of CTO as like, oh, okay, you're the, you're the, the, the top of the technology arm for this company. But what that minimizes is uh, the executive part, meaning like you're part of the executive team that is leading this company, right? That comes with a tremendous uh, like change in what your focus should be. And uh, you have to care about everything that those other peers of yours care about. I think a lot about um, uh, first team, right? Who's your first team? Uh, first team being the one that you consider like, this is, this is my primary team, the one I should prioritize, the, fo the focus should be here, where I spend most of my time should be here. And oftentimes people think of their first team as the people like that report to them. In a leadership position, it would be, you know, my head of product and my uh, head of software engineering and 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 head of data and and the head of IT and like all of these these great folks. That's my first team. That is not my first team. My first team is the executive team. My first team is my CEO, my CRO, my uh, you know uh, CFO. All, uh, all of these folks that um, I work with and spend a great deal of time with. 
And so my responsibility in that team, in that room, is, is not isolated to technology. It's incumbent upon me to really understand the 360 concerns this business faces. It's incumbent upon me to really influence the strategy with which we take. Now, I might not be the expert on how we um, you know, put this product in market, right? And I lean heavily on, uh, on my peer, uh, Josh, our CRO, uh, and his people to help with that. But I certainly need to understand it. And I certainly need to have like, you know, my, my sleeves rolled up and my, my fingerprints on that. And, uh, and, and it, it, it doesn't stop there. It's really all aspects. And one of the things that I, uh, I, I really feel like I've uh, gained a, a tremendous amount of perspective uh, uh, at this company uh, and, and learned a lot about is, you know, gotten much more deep into the financials of a successful business. And I think we've at times been an, like not, not a successful business. And right now we're, we're grateful that we are, we are a successful business that comes with hard work and understanding and alignment of that executive team to say like, this is what we need to do. There are hard problems. There are hard decisions to make to get there. Um, but like it's, an, it's really, really important for us to align on that, to understand that and to then execute against that and hold ourselves accountable to that. So one of the things, I don't think it's a secret, but I do think it's sometimes not as, as, as spoken about is the, the, I guess the C and the O as opposed to the T in the chief technology officer role, uh, is that, is that your first team is that executive, um, is that executive team. And as, a, as such, and you touched upon this in your question is you really need to have a, a, a much uh, a, a much larger perspective on on things, and of course you are absolutely supposed to be the expert in that conversation around where the technology and the product can be um, at most impactful for our customers uh, and and impactful for our business uh, at large. So, I, I think that's that's one of the things that I learned along the way that uh, has has been most helpful for me. Uh, and so maybe that I'll, I'll leave it with that one. That's great. And this is why, Praveen, you know, I tell now I'm in an age where I can tell people some advices, you know, yeah. and I wish, you know, I, I wish I can advise myself, you know, now at an earlier age to not push back on going and understanding the things you just mentioned. Like you, you, you touch on, for example, how to position this product from sales marketing perspective, understand the financial part. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, the reason, the main reason why I started this podcast, because when I was sitting in an IT department, we were, you know, I'm, I hope that you know, I will not expose any word, but I mean, we were always discussing us as colleagues, like why, you know, no one talked to us, you know, as, as technology department. And because I'm talking about like 15 years or 20 years back. And then, you know, I was start to become happy to see like the CTO role itself, you know, coming to the front and being not seen as, you know, the, yeah, he's the guy responsible for, for the IT yep. or he's the guy responsible for everything tech. And no, like become, a, actually the CTO is, is a driver, same as the CEO, as the CRO, as all the other C-levels to do these things. And the reason, you know, I wanted to do the show to prove that actually technology is blended, accepted or not with the business today. And people ask me, okay, why you have sometimes people who are not CTOs? I told you that yeah. at the beginning. I got CMOs, I got CROs, I got like all right. the C level C. And the reason I do this because I want like also tech folks to understand these things. And at the same time, I'm conveying a message to the because I focus also honestly in my show about you know entrepreneurship and startups. Right. So so fellow founders to understand this in an early stage rather than you know figure out oh. I wish I, ha I had brought someone who understands sales, or I wish I had brought someone who understands actually people management. You know, like all these things are part from, from, from a whole like mosaic, I would say, and each part is very important. And thank you for sharing this, Praveen, today. You know, like, and there is a lot of things I still can, can, can talk to you about today. But if, if one thing, you know, you felt that I missed and you want to just, you know, Tell us about it before we 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 get to 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 close. Well, uh, just a just a add on to um, what you were just talking about. I think a lot of different companies can like. I, I sometimes tell tell uh, my folks this is like roles are like roles and levels in a company are sort of our fiction, right? We decide what they mean and 
they should be useful to us in some way. And of course, there's some convergence in the industry at large about what these roles might mean, especially in, in the sense of like these senior roles like CTO. But it's important to like recognize what's the role supposed to be here, right? And you, you should really recognize that th you don't have to be like great at everything. That's the wonderful part of being part of a team is to like be, be complementary with each other. Uh, and, and especially when you're in a position of leadership like this, you get to build a team that can, um, supplement where you're strong and where you need help. And, uh, and, and if it's a responsibility of your area, you get to build a team that helps to deliver that. And so it's not, it's also important to recognize, like, you don't have to do this all alone. It's not like go become the master of all these things, follow curiosity, make sure that you like ask the question, like get the answers to the questions that are popping up in your mind when you're hearing things in meetings. Never zone out. Never zone out and say like, oh, this isn't my part. I uh, don't need to understand that. Don't understand it. Don't need to understand it. Moving on, right? Like every single one of those times where you're about to zone out, instead say, why don't I understand this? And let me, let me make sure that I do next time. And when you do, you zone out a lot less because everything becomes interesting and you become way more effective. So that would be the only thing I would add to what we just talked about for a, for a great CPO position. Exactly. Be, be always curious, I would say. Like, keep asking questions. Of course, you don't, maybe, okay. Like, it's not saying I, it's not, I don't have to care, but at least I need to understand what's going on, right? So, uh, yeah, 100%. So, Praveen, this is a final thing I ask, you know, where people can get in touch with you, how, how we can find more about also uh, World Crisis. Yeah, it's uh, workrise.com for, for the company. And uh, certainly I'm, I'm on there and uh, I'm on uh, not super active, more of a reader on Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, you can certainly find me on both of those channels as well. Feel free to hit me up if you have any questions or, uh, or just want to riff on something we talked about today. Sure, great. And again, I thank you very much, Praveen, for the time. I really enjoyed the discussion. Uh, a lot of things that, as I was telling you, I didn't live myself, but I've seen people struggling and you talk about what you're doing is very interesting at World Cries and advise everyone to, to have a look also as well and, and check. And, you know, yeah, as Praveen mentioned, you can uh, check the websites and get in touch with the guys. And uh, again, thank you for the valuable discussion. This is how I end my podcast episodes usually. So for the folks who are listening to us and they just discovered this podcast, for the first time. Thank you for passing by. I hope you enjoyed. I wish, you know, if you liked it, to subscribe and tell your friends and colleagues about it. And if you are one of the local fans who are, you know, always sending me their feedbacks and uh, their encouragement, thank you very much also for your loyalty. I really appreciate that. If you're interested to be on the show, you have an idea, you are working on something special. You don't have to be as, as a CTO, as I mentioned, you know, and it's door open for everyone as long as we talk about something related to startups, entrepreneurships, and of course, technology trends. So reach out to me and we can make a time for recording. Thank you very much for tuning in and we'll meet again very soon. Thank you. Hit that subscribe button, share the show with your tech savvy friends and fellow entrepreneurs, and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. Your support means the world to us.